I have no idea why I volunteered for the midnight shift. The extra 40 cents per hour wasn't really worth it. Everyone I was working with had good reasons to not take the shift that week. Me, being the nice person I am, took the shift no one wanted. If I didn't, it would have gone to someone with less seniority in the company. And I knew that everyone below me either had kids to look after or college classes. The person who was meant for the midnight shift had a medical emergency the day before. And it was such short notice, I knew it was causing problems. They had to find a body to fill the shift. And I stepped in, knowing it would be a hassle for others to change their schedule around. I really should be more selfish in the future. My job was out of town I lived. Because of that, I had to drive at least an hour on the highway each way. It was two hours of my day listening to audiobooks or podcasts, so it wasn't a complete waste. Plus, the pay was stupid high for such an easy job. I couldn't complain about the drive. But even so, I found the highway at night super creepy. For long stretches, there was nothing but endless trees on either side of the road. Driving in the pitch dark, only being able to see a few feet in front of you. And most of that few feet was just trees wasn't pleasant. At least for me. I watched The Blair Witch far too young. I know it's not a scary movie for anyone else, but seeing trees at night time? No thank you. But somehow, my kindness outshone my fear of the woods. I was driving in for my shift around 11.30 at night. I needed to speed if I would make it to work by midnight. But I saw something I couldn't ignore. On the side of the road, I saw a car pulled over and the driver's side door open. I didn't see anyone around the car as I came up on it. I saw it was a taxi and that gave off some red flags. A few months ago, my car needed to be taken in for some work. I hitched a ride with a coworker and we got talking just how expensive it would have been if I got a taxi or an Uber, even for one night. I didn't even want to think about how much it would cost if the taxi went by the meter. I had heard that sometimes they do a flat rate between cities, but once you're off the highway, the meter starts. I never bothered to find out if that was true. Seeing a taxi on the highway was weird enough. Seeing a taxi on the side of the highway, top light on and door open with no one around, was super weird. I think anyone would think that. But I may be the only person to pull over and see what was going on. I was already going to be late for work, but I knew it would bother me if I didn't at least check to see if someone needed help. I pulled over, but I had already passed the taxi when I decided to stop. Instead of backing up, I just got out of my car, taking my cell phone and flashlights out of my trunk. This could be some sort of scam, a way to get people to pull over to be robbed. But I honestly never heard of that happening, like ever. At least, not where I lived. And my flashlights weighed at least five pounds. I could get a good hit into someone and just make a run for it if I needed to. Kicking up dust as I walked over, I could tell something was very wrong even before I reached the car. I hadn't noticed before, but one of the back doors was open as well. I already had my phone out and dialed trying to get help on the way, but only got static, which I thought was also weird. I've never had issues with a signal out on the highway. My phone connected to my car. It would read texts while I was driving. Signal had never been an issue before. I think any normal person would have just left, but I guess I'm stupid. I looked inside the car looking for anyone or anything that would explain why the car was just sitting there. My stomach dropped when I saw some red. I knew it was blood over the driver's seat. I shone my flashlight on the ground to follow a trail of blood droplets with some hurried footprints leading off into the woods. It wasn't a lot of blood, but it wasn't a little either. Someone was hurt, but it was hard to tell how badly. I looked in the back of the taxi trying to find a weapon, but I didn't touch the car. I just leaned over trying to get a good look. The window of the red door that was open had been smashed. Glass littered the back seat and spilled onto the ground outside. Something had happened 
and I still couldn't get my phone to work. That was when I heard it, a scream, a man screaming for help from inside the woods. He sounded close enough for me to reach him. After everything I had seen and now heard, I really should have ditched the whole thing. But like I said, I'm stupid. Stay there, I shouted. I'm coming to help. Without a second thought, I took off running into the woods and where I thought I heard the scream. And it honestly was my worst nightmare. In the woods at night is so unsettling. I don't know how people go camping. My flashlight was bulky and had a good beam of light, but it could only go so far into the woods. The darkness where my light couldn't reach made my palms sweat. I couldn't stand not knowing what was out there in the dark, looking back at me. I scolded myself mentally, saying the only thing out there is someone who needs help. It was only when I was a few feet into the woods and to the point where I couldn't see the light of the taxi was when what I had actually just done sunk in. If a man was hurt out here, what had hurt him? Who had hurt him? It wasn't just him. Someone broke the window. Someone had been in the back seat and I only had a hefty flashlight and a cell phone that was still not working. I wanted to find the man and get the hell out of there when I heard something else. A woman's voice. Please can you help me find my son? I looked around trying to figure out where that voice came from. My beam of light scanning the dark trees but seeing nothing besides creepy trees that I hated. Please can you help me find my son? The voice came again, then again. She repeated herself three times and then fell silent. I started to shake. I just couldn't help it. The woman's voice sounded off. Have you ever seen that video of a bird talking in Japanese? It sounds so human and yet not. So close to human speech, but the tone is so slightly off, you're aware you're not talking to a human. That woman's voice sounded human, and yet not. Run! I screamed at the voice. Of course I screamed. An older man came running out of the trees, his lip tall and still bleeding. He rushed past me and made a grab for my arm to drag me along. He missed, but didn't even pause in running to try again. He just ran, trying not to trip over fallen branches and tree roots. He looked like a man who had just seen death itself. I was so shocked still seeing him, I may not have run after him if an ear-piercing scream hadn't come from behind me. That sound motivated me to run as fast as I could behind the man. That scream, that sound I still hear in my nightmares. Or even if I just let myself sit in silence for too long. I've been over hundreds of wildlife recordings trying to prove to myself I heard an escaped exotic pet or anything that would log logically explain that scream that I heard. It wasn't made by a human or an animal. It was nothing I ever heard since and I hope to never hear again. And it was right behind me. I somehow caught up to the man. I felt like we had run so far and yet we hadn't reached the road yet. I had to stop because my chest burned from running. We both stood gasping for air from fear and from running through the hard to navigate forest floor. The flashlight beam was powerful enough to light his face covered with blood, even if I wasn't pointing it directly at him. He nervously ran a hand over his face. It didn't wipe off anything, only getting his face bloodier. I had only heard a voice and a scream. I didn't want to know what this man had seen in the woods. We need to keep going, I told him once I was able to talk again. It's not my fault. He was running his bloody hand through his hair, clearly out of his mind from fright. I wanted to reach out to try and calm him down, but wasn't sure if that would upset him more. I decided to let him talk while I looked around, trying to find a way out of the trees. It's not my fault, I mean, she's pretty. She was pretty. She got into my cab, right? You understand, right? By some miracle, I spotted a light through the trees. I was positive came from the taxi from the road. I was just about to tell the man we needed to walk in that direction, but what he was saying made me stop. I had never been so afraid in my life being in those woods, but I still stopped to look over at him. What are you talking about? I asked slowly. 
Girls like that don't mean no, right? If they're so nice like that and smile at you like that, they want it, right? I didn't even do anything, I just parked. I didn't even get in the back seat. She was the one who leaned over. Damn bitch bit my lips off. She was the one who wanted it. As he spoke, his voice got more and more frantic. I stood in place watching him lose it. He was running his hands through his hair, tearing at it. His body shook and his eyes darted around wildly. That bitch isn't human, he shouted. He grabbed at his head with both hands and started to sob. This man, I didn't want to think of what would have happened to the woman in the back of his taxi if she was human. If he just picked up a normal person that night, what would he have done? Over his sobbing, I heard a branch crack, then another. I raised my flashlight to look into the darkness and finally saw her. She was pretty, that much was true. And also, not human. Long brown hair fell over her shoulders. She was only wearing a flower print sundress with the driver's blood down the front. Her face looked normal aside from her eyes. They were the eyes of a dead woman, blind and pale. She was only a few steps away from us. The sobbing man hadn't noticed her creep up behind him. She stood in the beam of a flashlight, almost curious what I would do. I did something I never expected of myself. While keeping the flashlight on the woman, I took a step back, then another. The taxi driver was in so much distress, he didn't notice me slowly backing away from him. It was only when I was a decent distance away from them, when the driver finally raised his head. I saw the horror on his face when he noticed I was now so far away from him. Almost in slow motion, I watched as he reached out a hand for me, and at the same time, the woman take him. Her mouth ripped open, causing her head to look like a demonic Pez toy. With her hands suddenly long claws, she grabbed his shoulder and latched into his neck. Her eyes stayed on me the entire time. Blood soaked the front of the driver's shirt before he could even scream. Th that woman never took her dead eyes off of me as she tore flesh away from the man. I didn't stay, stay around to see him rip her apart. I turned and ran as fast as I could towards the lights coming from the taxi. I got out of the woods without behind followed. I kept running to my car and flew in. My hands were shaking too much to even start the damn thing. On reflex, I checked my phone. I saw I had a signal and without any delay, I called the police. I don't know why I stayed in my car or why I didn't just leave after reporting my story. Even in my state, I knew I couldn't tell the truth. I told the operator that I spotted the taxi pulled over, saw some blood, and then I was about to go into the woods to try and help. I heard screaming that freaked me out, and I ran back to my car. Even after the cops showed up, they just took my story again and my info, and then dismissed me. I was very late for work, but after telling my bosses a very abridged version of the night's events, they forgave me. I still have trouble sleeping. I no longer do midnight shifts and I hate driving along the highway before the sun comes up on my early morning shifts. I looked up the case but didn't find many details. They only found blood from the driver but enough for them to be positive he was dead. I wasn't a suspect even though I found the car. I looked up the driver's name once I found it out and saw he had assaulted other women before. He had just been released and wasn't even a real taxi driver. They have no idea where he got the taxi from, but the police were sure he was using it to hunt other women. The bit of information about the case that made it impossible to sleep at night was who the woman was. They found her DNA on the broken window glass. The thing was, she had disappeared three years ago and assumed dead. She had gone missing in the woods with her son. Maybe I should get a new job. One much closer to home. People are disgusting creatures that leave trash everywhere. That's all right by me. I made some dumb choices back in the day. I spent a year or so locked away and now I can't find a job. Lord knows I'm trying. My mother, bless her, lets me stay with her until I can find something to pay my way. 
My hobby started when I was walking back home from a job interview. Even someone as dumb as me can tell was a no-go. When you have no job, you have no gas money. I walked everywhere, and when you walk everywhere, you see the amount of trash on the streets. I saw a beer bottle and a plastic bag to carry it home in. I picked it up. The dime I would get from it wasn't nothing when you have no job and gas money. When you're living off your mother at my age, you can't afford to leave a dime on the street when you see it. I was lucky enough that I found another liquor bottle that was worth a whole quarter. Now, that got me hooked. I did keep looking for a job and found a part-time gig at a fast food joint. They treated me like trash and I was only getting 15 hours a week. But it was like that beer bottle on the side of the road. When you have nothing, you don't leave a dime on the street. And when you have nothing, you don't leave a job that barely pays. In my spare time, I kept doing my civic duty and cleaned the streets. Pop cans is a good market. People just throw them everywhere. Aluminium can be recycled forever. I learned that from the metal recycle guys. So it's always on some sort of demand. Prices go up and down on it though. Some days it's 60 cent a pound. On other days it can be 80 cents. And it doesn't take much to make up a pound. Only like 30 cans, depending on the size. Now I pick up a can if I'm walking home from work or walking to work. I try and hold on to them until the prices go up, but sometimes we really need bread and a few bags of cans pays for that. Anyway, that's the setup for why on my days off, I walk around in the woods. It's not because I liked, liked nature or something. People are lazy. They come camping and they leave their trash. I make a pretty good amount off of picking up beer cans and bottles from campsites and high school parties. I got nothing else to do, so I clean up the rest of the trash too. Even stuff I won't make money on. I saw a dead squirrel with plastic wrapped around its neck once. A sad sight I didn't like. I'm not a hippie, just got nothing better to do. Like, I'm in the woods, right? I'm walking to an area that's kind of out the way. An old truck kids like to party at and is always loaded with beer bottles and cans. I can always find something there. I'm just walking, minding my own business. I turned my head to look around and make sure I'm not lost. The truck is not on a hiking trail and it's easy to get turned around in the woods if you don't keep track of the markers, like the double fallen trees or the huge ass rock. I was looking for the huge ass rock and saw something. The forest didn't go silent or anything. Nothing happened when I saw it. It felt like something should have happened when you did find such a thing, but it wasn't a special moment. I just looked over and between the branches and bushes, I saw a perfectly fresh looking head. I had thought it was a mask or some weird toy, but it was very clear that this was someone's head. Just sitting right in the middle of the woods, dead eyes looking up at the sky. At first, I did a double take, not being able to believe what I was seeing. Then a third take, and I nearly got sick. Figuring it was best not to puke and ruin a possible crime scene, I forced it back down. Plus, I didn't want the cops thinking I was some sort of pussy that pukes over something like this. It wasn't even that gory looking. At the, at the distance I was at, I couldn't tell if it was a guy or a girl only that they had short hair and pale skin. This was not my place to butt in. I would go to the ranger station and use their phone to report the head anonymously. I wasn't nothing more to do with it. Backtracking through the woods, I paused every feet to stick branches into the dirty marking a path. I figured the city cops that are going to come collect the head won't be good at hiking. The markers would make it easier to be found. And that was my plan, before it started to rain. Only a little at first, but it made me stop and think. How sorry that head was. It belonged to a person once, and now it's in the middle of the woods being rained on. I cursed myself and decided to turn around to cover it at the very least. I had a brand new, never used, clear recycling bags I could cover it with. I don't know if that would ruin the crime scene or anything like that. I had gloves and I doubted it would be tracked back to me. I was walking back following my own trial when I smelled the worst thing in my entire life. 
It smelled like a skunk rolled around in other dead skunks. I hadn't smelled the head when I was close to it. Breathing through my mouth, I could even taste the foul air. I didn't see anything, but it made me worry I somehow stumbled on the rest of the body. But it was strange that I hadn't smelled this when I walked in that direction to start with. I looked through the dense trees and listened to the light rainfall around me. I had come out for a few nickels and dimes, not for any of this. If I wasn't so damn reformed, I would have turned tail and left. And yet I was looking for some dead poor soul in the middle of the woods. And let me tell you, I didn't expect to find it. Honest to God, I saw how my life, it found me. Mind you, my life isn't worth nothing to swear on. So I swear on my mother's life. She's an older woman supporting her no good kid adult, so you know she's worth swearing on. And I don't give a damn if you don't believe me. Looking around the trees, I heard branches cracking. It was for certain footsteps. Expecting a hiker or camper, I looked towards them to ask for help with the whole dead body thing and was greeted by a sight that made me want to puke all over again. Standing a few feet away from me was in fact a headless corpse. I knew it was a corpse from the smell and the look of the poor bastard. Aside from the lack of head, it was all in one piece. Its dark skin was all shriveled up like a dummy. Like a butt juicer? It still had some rotten to do, but it was mostly skin and bones. The bastard didn't have a shirt on, only a dirty sheet tied around the waist for a weird sense of modesty. I tell you, if someone can look down your empty neck hole, not one is going to care about your junk. I really doubted I w what I was seeing. I don't mess with drugs. I've seen what that does to a person. Even as it was coming closer towards me, I didn't move because I was so short it wasn't real. I must have adjusted to the smell because I wasn't able to lose my lunch when it stopped in front of me. The damn thing was tall too. Even without a head, it towered over me. Uh, I said so very gracefully. What else could I say in that situation? I, uh, found a head. It's a bit too fresh to be yours. Just follow that trail of sticks. I stopped talking and flinched when it reached out and took my elbow. I expected it to rip my arm off or take my head, but no. It just held my arm in silence and expecting something of me. Even though my shirt sleeve, its bony fingers made my skin crawl. But to be honest, once you get used to it, it really felt like an any old person's hand. It clicked that the thing wanted me to guide it to the head. I guess it couldn't see, but I had no idea how it heard what I said, or why I even spoke to a he headless corpse in the first place. I forced myself to walk back, following my trail with the thing matching my steps. I questioned all my life choices that brought me up to that moment. The sad thing was, I was already doing what I would call to fix those little life choices. I was staying out of trouble. I was doing my best to get a job and support my mother. I didn't run with the crowd of people that had gotten me into creepy situations in the past, and yet I was still walking beside a headless corpse. I could have been having a breakdown, which would be a fair idea. But these things don't run in my family and I wasn't stressed. Not until I saw the head, Maybe that was it. I was in so much shock seeing a decapitated head. I broke and I was hallucinating a corpse to go with it. Seemed like a logical idea to me, but wasn't the idea mental breakdowns as you're not aware you're having one? Oh well, wasn't gonna change what I was doing. I led the corpse back to where I stopped before. I didn't want to get closer to the head and I was lucky enough that the corpse seemed to be able to sense it. I, it let go of my arm and walked a bit awkwardly towards the head that looked like it was just waiting to be picked up. With the same motions of a blind man reaching for his glasses, the large corpse patted around the room until it found what it was looking for. I watched as it packed up and ran a bony hand over the face. I wondered if it could see the face that way, or even if the corpse had any brain at all. 
Seeing them together, I knew the head didn't belong to the corpse. It was too small and the skin tone was off. It made me wonder where the head of the corpse was and where the missing second body was. Was it also walking around the woods looking? What had done this to them and why were they never here? It was certain I would never get the answers. When the corpse ran a hand over the head face, I swore I saw it smile. Its dead eyes stayed the same, but I felt like it was happy it had been found. I'll be going now. I took a few steps back to excuse myself from the whole thing. The corpse turned towards me, scaring me enough to stop for a second. It raised its arm to give a little wave. You would think I would stay out of those damn woods after that, but it's a good place to get bottles and cans so I could still go. I didn't report what I had seen because I had no idea and no head or proof. I do check the missing cases from time to time to see a face I recognize. I've heard stories from the campers who started to recognize me. They gave me their bottles instead of taking them back themselves. Stories about some monster ripping heads off unwary campers and adding it to a collection. There had only been the corpse found without a head in the past 10 years. And that was enough to star the stories. But the corpse had been found with a lot more things missing. And they even found out who it belonged to. But still, it became a ghost story. But I don't feel like that's the case. A monster ripping off heads, I mean. I think humans are the ones killing and dumping bodies out there. Sometimes the bodies are found and sometimes they're not. Animals eat everything, even the heads. But the monster they're talking about might find those heads first. I think it's taking the heads to remember the faces of the dead. The faces that might never be found or put back together again. If humans found them, they might make them in an awful police sketch that, never, that might never lead to the person being found. I think it's a nice thought that no matter what, at least someone is going to remember their face. That someone is going to know how they looked, monster or not. Or maybe... It just eats them. Who knows when it comes to weird, headless corpses. When I was a child, not even a teen yet, I was taken from my family. My mother had too many children and I was the oldest. There is a chance that she sold me to support my siblings but I would like to believe that the men who dragged me from my home threatened her, and the choice wasn't a choice at all. For the next 10 years of my life, I lived on fishing boats, very rarely going ashore. That happens fairly often where I was born. Because of big fishing ships taking everything, locals needed to go further and further out, trying to get the scarce food to feed their families. Eventually, Corruption rotted the fishing trade so thoroughly, every aspect of it was toxic. I believe if you start digging, you can find this information fairly quickly, but no one wants to dig. No one wants to know the cruelty that goes into the fish fingers they feed their child when they're too tired to cook a real meal. Large fishing ships destroy the seas. What they don't keep, they kill. The smaller fishing boats that treat their unwanted catches slightly better are run by crime organizations and human slaves. I was one of those slaves, but I've seen how others were treated. I didn't have my freedom, but on the boats, I ended up, I was treated almost like a human. I bounced around at first before remaining on that boat for five years. It was a decent size. It could carry 20 men but that trip we had an extra 10. Those 10 were going to be transported to an island and then scattered to other fishing boats. We had only been on the sea for a few days, but with the cramped living space and heat of the year, everyone was in a hot temper. Our captain could be a cruel man. If you got sick, it was cheaper to toss you to the sea instead of getting treated. On that trip, his brother N was on board. I met him often while I worked on the boats. His brother was cruel in a different way. He did everything the captain did, but he made you still like him afterwards. As much as I wanted it, I couldn't entirely dislike the man. 
He spoke to me like an adult and at times shared fresh fruit with the crew. I suppose it was to keep us somewhat healthy when they couldn't afford to buy a new worker. If you could do anything, go anywhere, what would you do? En asked me one day, leaning on the railing, looking off into the sea. I only know how to fish, I answered back, not pausing in my work. En was like that. His kindness always had a motive behind it. He asked some of the others he had on the boat the same sort of questions. One boy answered, telling truthfully of his dreams. En quickly got into the boy's head and found out that the boy and another man had a plan of escaping the boat. I never saw either of them again. I only hope they were sold somewhere else and not dumped overboard. The last time on that boat, En approached me again, trying to get me to open up about how the men were feeling. I knew he only wanted to know if a mutiny was brewing due to our poor conditions. How long have you known each other? Five years? You've grown so much, it's almost like our own child. How about you come up to the captain's room for a cold drink? The heat is going to kill someone today, and I'd like it if you lived till tomorrow. En was smiling at me, fully expecting for me to agree. I knew his plan and wanted to dislike him for it, but he made it impossible. No, thank you. I'll be fine. The captain would be asleep trying to avoid the heat, so I was at no risk of him giving me a hard time. But if others on the boat saw me getting close or any kind of favoritism, my life would become difficult. I saw En's face drop only a little. Even after the years, he still thought he was able to charm me. Still, I wish the wind would pick up. At this rate, we'll have to add an extra day to our trip, En commented. For a few hours, the wind had been calm, then stopped altogether. Without the wind to cool us down, we would be too overheated to work the boat and required more rest. Because some men were promised to others, the captain had to care about their well-being. I only nodded in agreement with En staring at me. He planned on getting into my head, but gave up for that day. He would offer a different man the cold drink to try and get an inside look on how the crew were feeling. After he left me to my work, the oddest thing happened. Something I had never seen on the sea before. A fog rolled in. We saw it coming and tried to get the boat moving to avoid it, but it just swept in at an unnatural speed. I had of course seen fog on the ocean before, but never without a difference in temperature and never so fast in the middle of the day. I was on the deck when it happened. I stared off, trying to see anything in the dense mist. En had come out on deck, looking as confused as the rest of us. Is that an island? Are we off course? He asked, his calm voice breaking. I could see a darker mass that did look like some sort of land off in the distance and through the mist. But we shouldn't be near any land. It wasn't another ship. The shape was all wrong. It had to be an island, even though I had no idea how we would have gotten so off course. We'll just wait out this mist and see where we are, I said, trying to keep working, even though my hands were shaking. I couldn't explain it. It was just mist, but the strange nature of it unnerved even myself. I was so busy trying to stay working, I didn't notice a different man go to the railing of the boat and peer down into the sea. I didn't know his name. It was easier on a person not knowing names of the people who passed through. There's a person down there, he shouted, panicked. I got up and rushed over to try and see what he was pointing at. En came beside me and we all looked, spotting a pale form in the wind water. It was hard to see through the mist. As we were straining to see, another form came up, this one darker and easier to see than the first. Then another. Then another. Soon the ship was surrounded by human-shaped forms bobbing in the water. Did a ship crash? The man asked, his voice dry and shaking. I was frozen by the sight of it all. Breaking out of my shock, I ran over trying to find anything to toss out, to try and save these people, if they could be saved. I was away from the railing when I heard the sound. I expected screaming or pleading from the people in the sea, but it wasn't that. 
It was a pleasant sound, a sound of voices mixed in with some sort of wind instruments I had never heard before and have never heard since. My stomach turned into a ball of excitement. It fluttered with the music that surrounded the boat. I saw the other men come on board trying to find the source, their faces unable to be seen through the mist. Then I heard the first splash. Forgetting the strange, pleasant feeling, I turned my head just in time to watch a man jump over the railing. And then another. I saw N's form and rushed over to pull him away just as his body had started to move, trying to get off the boat. They thrashed in my arms, yelling at me, pleading to let him go. My years of hard labor made me stronger than him. If I could tie him down, I could move on to the next person, trying to save them as well. I regretted I could only help one person at a time. And I didn't know why I was trying to save N first. He was the only man I could even remotely consider a friend, even after all the horrible things I had seen him do. As I was trying to save N, the men rushed to the railings, jumping off, shouting they heard their wives singing. For the unmarried ones, they were excited, shouting, shouting about the hearing female voices and how they could see such attractive young women in the ocean, just waiting for them to be saved. It was all happening so fast, I almost ignored what N was shouting. My daughter, she's out there. Let me go. I have to get her. I knew she wasn't dead. I just knew it. My mother was lying. I didn't harm her, so let me go. My shaking hands were having trouble with the rope. I was able to almost get N tied down, but stopped when those words sank into my mind. The other men were jumping out in lust, completely overtaken by the song. They were seeing the women they loved, or just women they could love. And yet N was shouting about his daughter. The look in his eyes and how he struggled to be free made me nearly sick. I didn't confirm my feelings, I didn't need to. Everything had happened so fast. By the time I let N go into the sea where he belonged, the rest of the men had rushed out, leaving it impossible to save anyone. There had been innocent people on that ship, but I wasted my time trying to save the one man who committed such a horrible crime in his past. I couldn't let myself think of it. I just let him go and watched him in his glee jump off the side without any hesitation. I knew I was alone, but I still heard the song. Standing in the middle of the deck, looking out at the bobbing shapes, I still felt a fluttering in my stomach, but not the same pull the other men had. I stood waiting for something to happen, and I think the source of that song was also waiting. It knew I was still in the boat, so it sang trying to lure me to the sea, and with the rest. Slowly, I walked over closer to the railing to look out, but not to jump out. In the water, the human shapes had their heads peeking above the surface, singing to me, but nothing else. I didn't see any signs of the crew in those waters. Eventually, the song stopped. I think whatever was making it knew I wasn't going into the sea. Suddenly, the boat rocked as if something massive just passed beside it or underneath it. I watched as the human form started to move all at once. Some came out of the water a bit more, and even though the mist I could see, they were the only upper half of a human. Long hair covered their faces and limp arms moved with the sea. Their bodies formed into a long, thick rope-like mass that disappeared under the water. They all moved as one as they started to leave. I couldn't shake the feeling, the image that those bodies were all connected to an unseen mass deep in the ocean. Those bodies were like the lights of an anglerfish. The song making their prey see those fake bodies as whatever they wanted to see. I was left alone with the boat and a silent ocean. The mist faded, leaving me with the horror of what just happened. I sold the boat and used the money to get as far away from the ocean as possible. No one knew how, but they thought I had killed everyone aboard. I couldn't tell them the truth. Even if they believed me, I would still be killed for selling the boat to a rival gang. I had thought about why I was spared. 
those men heard something that made them lust enough to jump out into the sea. And that was the reason why I was spared. I never thought about it. I had no time to think about it working on those ships, but I had never had such desires. Even after I gained some freedom, I found myself never having the urge to get in such a relationship with anyone. I don't think that creature had ever encountered something it couldn't lure, and thus had no idea how to deal with such a situation. I also had thought about what the thing was. I think overfishing is the reason why that thing could come to the surface. Without its food source, it's trying to find the next best thing. The ocean is deep. We don't know what's under the waves, and I pray we never find out.